Hello and welcome back to my podcast, Supreme Myths. I am delighted today to have as my guest Caroline Fredrickson, um, who is currently a distinguished visitor from practice at Georgetown Law School uh, for the last 10 years before that, I think from 2009 to 2019. Caroline was the um, head, president, CEO, whatever you want to call it, of the American Constitution Society, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Uh, she went to Columbia undergrad and Yale Law School. Before working for the American Constitution Society, she worked for NARAL, the ACLU. She was in the Clinton administration. She's written a zillion articles and essays, uh, two books. The most recent one, the title could be like a primer for our time or a call for our time. The title of Caroline's newest book is The Democracy Fix, How to Win the uh, Fight for Fair Rules, Fair Courts, and Fair Elections. Fair Rules, Fair Courts, Fair Elections. Lord, I wish we had that. Caroline, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure always to talk to you. Uh, thanks for being here. And we should disclose at the outset, you and I, because we're going to talk about this, you and I wrote an op-ed together for the New York Times this summer about the Federalist Society, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, so first, how did you come to be the head of ACS? What drove you to that job? Um, and what was it like doing that for a decade? Oh, well, you know, it was a tremendous experience. I feel so lucky to have been there. Um, but you know, so so what what happened was sort of it was sort of funny because I I remember exactly the moment when ACS was founded. Um, I was actually working on the Hill. I was chief of staff to Maria Cantwell, as a senator from Washington State, and um, she happened to be very good friends with um, with Peter Rubin, who was um, one of those uh, who who came to realize that um, there was such an imbalance in how the left and the right, or you know, progressives and conservatives, looked at the courts, and that. The Federalist Society was eating our lunch, and um, and that nobody um, who viewed the Constitution as actually egalitarian, emanci emancipatory, and and future looking um, um, had been playing a role in who the judges were, and in, instead had ceded ground to uh, to those who think we're constrained by what people in 1789 might have thought if we could delve into their psyches um, <laughs> through some kind of strange psychological. Um, Magic um, and understand what they what they thought about a particular word in a in an ancient document, um, but and so he he helped create something called the American Constitution Society and um, the first convention, uh, my boss Maria Campbell happened to be invited to go and speak and so I went along with her and I thought you know this was the thing I really needed in law school when we had a thousand different student groups which were all really necessary, but there was no overarching kind of a. Um, uh, uh, association that kind of brought um, progressive values together around a strategy for advancing them in, in a more systematic way through the court system, ensuring that we have judges um, who are committed to um, an understanding of the Constitution um, that uh, that does see that it, it, sh it should remain relevant in a changing world. Um, and uh, and as well as committed to the to the deep values of the um, uh, of, of, an, of equality, uh, and liberty that we, I think, all see in the in the Constitution. At least those of us who are not members of the Federalist Society. <laughs> um, and did and and what what were just a few of the challenges and frustrations working for ACS? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, and, and, and and Joyce, I should say, and Joyce too. Yeah. So it's a long story short. I left out that I then went to the ACLU. I ran their legislative arm for a number of years, and um, which I was loving, and and never um, had 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 planned on leaving, but. Um, um, happened to you know know that the prior executive director of ACS had moved on to be in the in the Obama transition and then in the Obama White House, um, and I was trying to help them find somebody to run it. And the board chair at that time, Goodwin Liu, who's now in the California Supreme Court, said, "Well, why aren't you applying?" And I thought, "Well, I love my job at the ACLU," but then I thought, "Wow, such possibilities at ACS, you know, a, a much newer organization and so important." Um, and um, but so yeah, so then I went into to ACS and we really helped it flourish. It grew significantly, um, you know, greater and greater appreciation for the significance of the courts and and interpretation. How do we approach and understand our constitution? Has just become much more um, has moved much farther um, among those who are not part of the far extreme right. Um, and uh, I think, you know, people like you, Eric, who are constantly debunking the, the intellectual poverty of the of the of the of originalism um, really have have helped to bring that to light to show that the uh, the Federalist Society and its so-called 
jurisprudential ideas are just a Potemkin village and what's behind them are the Koch brothers, um, the, the, the Mercers, other oligarchs who are simply trying to protect um, their self-interest um, and destroy the ability of the vast majority of Americans to flourish. So, so, let's, so let's get right to that. I, I'm going to ask you about your book later, but, but let's just sure. get right, right to the Federalist Society. Um, so uh, um, I think I have in the last few months, maybe the last year, been trying to send a public message and failing um, to a great degree. I mean, you and I tried in the Times that the problem with the Federalist Society is the leadership. It's not the mm -hmm. thousands of lawyers and students who are really there for the debates, who really are there. Maybe they have a conservative leaning and a libertarian leaning, but I don't. I think there are a lot of non-Trump supporters. I really do in the Federalist Society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's why I continue. So I, this Friday, I'm doing a fairly big debate on originalism. Uh, Friday night fights. You know, I think there's going to be like 500 uh -huh. members of the. And and I and I and I and I, I, I always tell them I'm ha I'd love to do it. I'm flattered. Thanks for asking. If you say you don't support people for office, I'm going to have to politely say before I say anything that I disagree with that. And mm -hmm. respectfully, but I disagree with it. It's just not true. Now let's move on and talk about originalism or whatever. Um, but I kind of also feel guilty about doing these things for the Federalist Society. Erwin Chemerinsky has stopped doing things for the Federalist mm -hmm. Society. Um, can you make me feel better about that distinction between the leadership and the rank and file? Because I do think there's a difference. I I, you know, I, I would have agreed with you, Eric, in the past, but yeah. I, you know, I guess I'd see somebody like a George Conway um, who, um, you know, you could say he's he's definitely a very strong never Trumper, um, founded the Lincoln Project. He had another piece in the Washington Post today, um, uh, which was, you know, very tongue in cheek about why he believes Donald Trump, um, you know, worth reading. But on the other hand, you know, where I, I and I, you know, can say that when, when I was in law school, and I think a lot of law professors and law students have this experience of the Federalist Studies, really is a forum for um, for debating ideas. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you have the vast infrastructure here supporting the kinds of judges who are being moved through the system by Leonard Leo, it's kind of hard to separate. I mean, I, I guess at a certain point, they're complicit. And so a George Conway can say he's against Trump, but if he can't also say he's for Trump's judges, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Because the, the Trump judges are the ones who are implementing uh, terrible policies on voting, terrible policies. On, I mean, look at, you know, how many do we have to cite in just the last few months? But before that, Citizens United and Shelby County and and so forth, tearing the heart out of our democracy um, with such, you know, cramped and bizarre views about what the First Amendment includes and what the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment or the Voting Rights Act would allow. I, you know, I just so yes and no. I guess I can't go all the way with you on that one. Yeah, I it, um not to make this all about me, but just for two minutes. Um, I've really been struggling with this. Um, my, my, my school doesn't have a conservative or libertarian public law professor in, in any, any area close to con law. There may be some economic people, but no, no, and I am the de facto advisor for my students in the Federalist Society, and I help them bring in people for debates and that. And, and I've been doing that for, for a long time now, and I love my students, and I love them. Like, I mean, I, I think they're... And, and, and so that's one rationale I tell myself. <laughs> Another rationale is, so there are going to be 500 or so, I think, Federalist Society students at this thing on Friday night, this virtual thing on Friday night. If I can change the minds of 15 of those or 30 of those out of 500, maybe it's worth it. I know that might be a pipe dream or a very bad rationalization. Um, but we do agree, and, and, and this is a much more important issue, the idea that they still deny that they support people for public office and that prominent law professors still pretend that the Federalist Society doesn't support people for public office is so wrong and, and, and so false. Spend a couple minutes debunking that, please. Well, boy, there's just been another report about yeah. yet another secret um, dark money organization that Leonard Leo has founded um, which has apparently got in eighty million dollars, raised eighty million dollars to support um, far right wing judges for the courts, and um, you know this is on top of all the other amazing investigative journalism that has been done, um, that has really gotten behind um, what has been going on, the, the deep connections between the Federalist Society, the Judicial 
crisis network, the... Um, By the way, the, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Caroline, but just on that point, I want to call this out. David Bernstein, a law professor at the Antonin Scalia Fake Originalism School of Law, um, really went at me on a con law list that we're on when I said that Leo and Carrie Savino are clearly working together, have been working together for years. He denied all of that in front of— Well, that's crazy. I know. I mean, that's not—they uh, don't even deny it. I mean, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Carrie Severino would even deny it or Leonard Leo. I mean, they, they had— you know, the Judicial Crisis Network had its office in the same floor of the same building as the Federalist Society. All of their donors are the same. They have the same boards of directors. They all work for each other and hire each other as consultants. And anyway, this this latest enterprise from, from Leonard Leo is $80 million. I mean, Judicial Crisis Network itself had $20 million. They have no staff except Carrie Severino. It's just a pass through for running ad attack ads. Um, uh, to uh, go after Democrats or, you know, especially apostate Republican senators who might not have signed up to uh, support, you know, whatever nominee the Federalist Society coughs up. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I think Kerry is I don't know much about Leonard Leo other than what I've read about him and kind of but I know about her. And I mean, she's just a shill for the Koch brothers. It's basically what mm -hmm. she is. And that and those interests. Well, here's a little funny tidbit. I debated her on the news hour um, a couple of times um, when um, the Democrats changed the rules um, uh, in the Senate so that they could uh, overcome a huge obstruction of yeah. Barack Obama's nominees. And so they got rid of the, um, the at least the, the 60 vote requirement for um, lower court nominees. And uh, so we were on the news hour and she was talking about how the Democrats were trying to pack the DC circuit. I said, <laughs> It's they're just filling three existing vacancies is what they're doing. <laughs> three existing vacancies. Um, and, you know, it's just it's so very interesting now. Of course, packing the courts is something that um, uh, the, the right is doing very effectively, filling every single one of those slots with uh, somebody who's 25 and um, yeah. and uh, barely graduated from law school. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. This guy, Justin Walker who has no experience at all to be a judge, was named to the district court in Kentucky, and now he's on the D.C. Circuit. He wrote the crazy, long, religious dogma, mm -hmm. I mean that word, uh, mm -hmm. opinion in one of the COVID cases. He wrote it to show his bona fides and all that. Um, and the man is he's in his late 30s, I think. I'm not positive, but I mm -hmm. think. Um, mm -hmm. But he's just unqualified in every way to be a judge, in every way. He has yeah. no experience. Either district court or court of appeals. And there's a ton of him. Um, one last thing about the Federalist Society, and then we'll move on. Um, if you can't answer this question, I understand. I'm, I'm curious what ACS's total budget is compared to, for example, the $80 million that Leonard Leo has to play with to get judges confirmed. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I might have to defer that because I haven't been there for now. Yeah. Well, I left at the end of uh, – of 2019. And so, you know, this, I don't know how it's been affected by, um, right. um, but I could say, um, we were a decent size. I mean, I, I had more than doubled the budget while I was there. So it was over $7 million. Um, I don't, so I don't know what it is now. You had um, seven, well, no, wait, I was, that's, that's the, that's the context of this. You had seven. Okay, yeah. But so the Federalist Society is like, a, I don't know, eight times the size or more. I think I, they have know, $7 million dollars a day to spend probably. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so much bigger, so yeah. much bigger. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, but again, because, you know, we didn't have the Koch brothers behind us and there was so much more cohesion on the right um, over what's important. They get that the courts are a vital part of the government that, you know, when you have three branches, you know, and, the, and that you, you actually have to understand that each one of those branches has a role and some and power. Um, and so they invest in them. They invest in elections. They invest in uh, 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 but also in, in developing a, a cadre of 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 people who could be nominated um, and groomed and nominated um, put on the bench. Right. And to be fair to Leonard Leo, I think this last $80 million is more to support voter suppression than to vote judges. Uh, <laughs> but you Well, know. they're electing uh, judges at the state level, too, and prosecutors and, you know, and others. So I, I don't know how much of whether any of the money is going to that. But they have definitely been very involved in um, state court elections. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm told that in Florida you can't get on the appellate courts without being a member of the Federalist Society. Now that's what I've been told, which is crazy if you think about it. Um, yeah. Okay. I want to talk about this great book you wrote, um, 
and the democracy fix. And I, I actually want to start with a small piece of it, Caroline, because it's it's relevant to a string of podcasts I've been doing and kind of relevant to what I think the American people have to accept, although you and I may not agree 100 percent on this, and that's okay. But you write about the Powell memo in this book mm-hmm. and how much, what effect the Lewis Powell memo had. And, and my context for you discussing this or how I'd like you to discuss it is that constitutional law is not now and never has been about meaning, the meaning of things. It's about results, consequences, what happens. And prior to the Powell memo, Justice Powell, I'm going to set it up for you. Lewis Powell was a um, business uh, lawyer for co- big corporations in the Chamber of Commerce in Virginia before he became a Supreme Court justice. And in that position, he wrote a memo saying that conservatives and corporations and moneyed interests should pay much more attention to the courts. And, here, and, and, and then here's a fact of the matter. At the time he wrote that memo, commercial speech was given zero protection by the United States Supreme Court. None. Zero. Really none. Tell a story after that. Okay. So let me just also give a little more context for Lewis Powell, which is that he was a tobacco lawyer. So that makes it somehow even more relevant to what was going on. But so at the time, um, uh, to to, to take us back to a time when I think, um, you know, we were small children. Um, and, <laughs> I was a, I was a uh, teenager. I was I was I was eleven. Okay, the fifteen. All right. Well, 15. I was I was a little little littler. Um, yeah. But I was. Uh, but so you know, there were the the courts were actually being used um, fairly successfully by uh, a group of consumer advocates like Ralph Nader um, back in the day when he wore a white hat. <laughs> we could think yeah. of him in a positive way. Um, and uh, and labor and and others and and there was broad um, environmental movement which was really coming into being and Earth Day um, uh, sort of took over in the country. There were demonstrations all over. Um, Richard Nixon set up the EPA, um, you know, and there was and so um, for for Powell, this was frightening. It, it was the the end of the uh, of of the free enterprise system was at hand. Um, so he wrote this impassioned memo to the chamber, which then got circulated very quickly throughout all the major members, uh, you know, the sort of the, the largest corporations in America, um, where he basically said, you know what, we need to invest in kind of long term thinking, build institutions that are going to sort of um, develop and maintain power over the long term through um, using think tanks, the media um, and, of course, the courts as well as electoral strategies to really to to sort of absolutely anchor their vision this deregulatory anti civil rights anti labor vision of what the united states should be like and so there around the powell memo grew um uh, and out of it grew the heritage foundation um ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, to develop um, a a model legislation for state legislatures, the Federalist Society to create a pipeline of judges, but then also litigating groups like the Chamber of Commerce uh, litigation litigation arm, um, so that they could take advantage of the friendly faces that they now saw on the on the court bench. Um, And then the think tanks uh, produced for them, you know, cookie cutter kind of legal thinking that they could bring in front of those courts about why it was that regulation should be struck down and um, and the free enterprise system protected. And um, and then the media, um, which um, initially was about debunking the so-called, you know, mainstream liberal media um, and creating an alternative voice. And they did that, you know, with great success when then Fox News was founded. Um, and uh, so the, the, the real through line here is that the Powell memo was not just related to this, but actually was the inspiration for and the and and the focal point for the beginning of all the building of these organizations, institutions that still persist perniciously. And, and that and that memo was written in seventy three. Is that right? Seventy two, something like that. Seventy seventy two. Yeah, think. and he becomes a justice yeah. just a year later, mm-hmm. and then he writes the opinion that basically overturns. 50 years of the Supreme Court, 30, 40 years of the Supreme Court saying commercial speech is not protected, and all of a sudden commercial speech becomes protected. It then takes a while, but eventually mm-hmm. now commercial speech is kind of the most, almost the most protected speech. Um, yeah. yeah, well, you know, and I just have to say that the irony here, and maybe to 
to to to make this extremely clear to the people who are watching or listening to this, people think of Lewis Powell now as one of the more moderate yeah. Republican appointees, right? Yeah. So just imagine how the court has shifted has shifted without us being able to make the case to a broader American public that the Supreme Court is so far to the right now. Only if you look at Justice Powell as being considered a moderate and see where he came out of, what he came out of and what he was advocating, does that make you realize how far out of step the court is with American society? Yeah, he actually reaffirmed Roe in in, in an early mm-hmm. abortion case. Um, and he did vote in Bowers versus Hardwick to uphold Georgia's anti-sodomy law, but he did it extremely reluctantly. He said if mm-hmm. anybody would go to jail, he might feel differently about it. And, of course, the famous story out of that is he, he was a southern gentleman from Virginia, and he told his law clerk he had never met a gay person, and his law clerk, of course, was gay. Um, and uh, one of the great ironies yeah. of Supreme Court history. And then when he retired, he, he did something of, uh, I, I respect. He said, I was wrong. He said, I regret mm-hmm. Bowers. And this is before Lawrence, before Bowers was overruled. Uh-huh. So uh, the weird thing about him to me, um, he was a swing vote on the court until Justice O'Connor got there. I mean, he really was. And even after O'Connor, he was kind of a swing vote until Ke- Kennedy got there. Well, maybe, I mean, maybe an explanation for Justice Powell in some ways is that, you know, he, he was really predated the explicit linkage between the economic right and the religious right. Yeah. Um, which um, when they wanted to kind of make – more advances on the electoral side, they realized that, you know, the Chamber of Commerce um, message wasn't really going to appeal to white working class voters in West Virginia, for example, and they could turn to other strategies. And so they actually, so, you know, Paul Weyrich, who I write about in the book, um, was one of those sort of in the early um, uh, followers of the Powell memo, and he helped establish not just ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Heritage Foundation, but also the Moral Majority. Um, recognizing that, you know, the money that came from kind of corporate America and the anti-regulatory folks, the Koch brothers, et cetera, could be used on the electoral side to bring kind of more social kind of messages to um, to voters. And, and, you know, as well as race, using race as a, as a, as a tool to separate um, uh, voters. And yeah. so um, so I think Justice Powell is sort of, you know, he, he's still on the more libertarian side of that um, uh, before they made that, you know, sort of bar- yeah. devil's bargain. Um, that name, Paul Weirich, um, so, you know, Sarah Posner, who's a friend of mine on Twitter, and I met her a couple of times, Sarah Posner um, wrote a whole book recently called Unholy about how the evangelicals came into the movement mm. and then how they've stayed in the movement. And, he, and she says, Paul, that's a name Americans should know. <laughs> He's dead now. But he was incredibly powerful, mm-hmm. setting up heritage, setting up Alec, bringing in the – in 1977, I think it was, or 76, Jerry Falwell was asked, what do you think about abortion? He said, I don't care. It's not a big issue for us. Mm-hmm. It was only when the votes – it was only when money and power came into play that evangelicals turned to abortion as mm-hmm. a big issue. That's exactly. not a conversation for you and I necessarily, but it's something Americans should know about. I mean it's um, – and I don't think Powell was on that side of it. Mm-hmm. No, that's absolutely true. They really, they kind of, they made it an issue because it worked for them. Um, you, in your book, you use phrases like gaming democracy, evil geniuses, screwed for too long, <laughs> all those kind of things. Um, tell me, or tell us, um, you know, in a uh, not soundbite, but not extended kind of way, um, what you mean by that? I mean, wh- where are we today where we would not be if it wasn't for these people? These well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I, you know, became increasingly clear to me as I did the research on this book was was how willing. I mean, it seems like you know very understated now in the <laughs> age of Trump, but how willing they were to basically change the rules to favor themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can't win voters over by selling your selling your ideas, then just make it really hard for people to vote. Um, you know, gerrymander the hell out of districts so that you always. Um, will win. I mean, you look at, at, you know, in 2010, when um, the Democrats were basically twiddling their thumbs, or I don't know what, you know, Karl Rove was running his red map program, where, um, you know, he recognized that, you know, the, the 2010 census was going to mean redistricting, you know, in for the next cycle, um, you know, meant that you needed to win the state houses just enough, and in swing states, um, to make a difference. And so, you know, he was able to raise 
a fairly small amount of money. It was $30 million just to target, you know, five or six states. And they had only a handful of seats in each of those states, but just enough to tar to switch those those state houses um, and where they had a Republican governor. So it was very tactical. Um, and he wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal in 2009, basically say, here's what I'm doing. <laughs> and the Democrats just Lay down. didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, and so as a result, we see this all now playing out, right? These are the districts that are, uh, you know, the Democrats were able to win the House despite that in, in, um, in recent years. But they're overcoming a huge deficit of, of, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, they, they have to get so many more votes to actually come, on, come in even. And you can look at, you know, the last election, 2018 for North Carolina, where, um, you know, there are 13 seat, House seats from North Carolina. And the Democrats and the Republicans split almost 50-50. The Republicans had a little over 50. The Democrats at like 48.5 or something percent of the vote. Out of those number of seats, the Democrats won, I believe it was three. Yeah. And the Wisconsin Republicans is the same got way. the rest of them. Yeah. I mean, so like they play hardball and the Democrats play nice. I mean, I think, you know, as much as I like the Obamas, you know, the whole idea of they, you know, they go high, you know, when they go low, we go high. Um, yeah, I don't think we should be doing things that are illegal and unethical, but we should be fighting like hell to make sure that they don't go to get away with that stuff. And we can't, you know, when when there's an opportunity to actually engage in a process of redistricting, you know, people who care about progressive values should not simply be passive. Yeah, I agree with I, I, that. Well said. Um, and you know what? It's about to get much worse because uh, on that very issue, just last night, the Supreme Court, I think. For the first time ever, Justice Kavanaugh cited Bush versus Gore. I think it's the first time any Supreme Court justice has ever cited Bush versus Gore. I could be wrong about that, but I think so. And what they're doing now, Caroline, which is directly relevant to Karl Rove, goes back to 2010, is what they're saying is state Supreme Courts are not allowed to override state legislatures because of this ridiculous reading of the Constitution that we won't get into here, but in, in Article 2. Mm -hmm. um, and so controlling state legislatures is everything. Absolutely. And, and yeah. they know that. John Roberts knows that. Kavanaugh knows that. And they know what's happening is state Supreme Courts that are not controlled by Republicans are trying to get fair elections. And same thing with lower federal district courts. They let Pennsylvania get by with this the first time around. I don't think they're going to let it do it again. But it doesn't matter. There's been a, a bevy of lower federal court rulings basically implementing state constitutions, saying the state constitution requires, this is the federal constitution, and overturned, 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 because state legislatures are supreme, even over state right. supreme courts. Mm -hmm. so, even when the state constitution requires fair elections. Yes, yes. So Roe's yeah. strategy, I'm just buttressing your point, that Roe's strategy of getting state houses is absolutely crucial to federal elections. Mm -hmm. and, and that's... Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, it's the, the redistricting and apportionment, um, you know, for those of us, you know, I, I live in Maryland, so I, you know, I'm a pretty democratic state house yeah. right now. But for those people who live um, in other states, like, say, for example, Georgia, where, you know, you, you also want to be fairly represented at the state level. And so, you know, what are the districts going to look like for your state house? Um, yeah. You know, this is all coming to play. And are they those districts going to be drawn in a way that actually, you know, uh, has a uh, fair amount of sense or is it could are they going to be drawn in a way that simply ensures that the republican state houses stay in republican hands yeah amazingly um, enough the least technological savvy justice i think of the last and there have been a lot of them of the last 40 years justice Souter, he's the one who in 1985 i think it was no no 95 excuse me 19 somewhere after he was appointed um in one of the redistricting cases he wrote a very long dissenting opinion saying computers have changed everything Gerrymandering has mm -hmm. always been here. Both sides do it. But now computers can do it with pinpoint accuracy. Mm -hmm. And if the law doesn't catch up, we're doomed. And the mm -hmm. law hasn't caught up. And whether we're doomed or not, we'll see in next week. But I think we're in yeah. big trouble. I think we're in big trouble. Yes, All right. I'm going to ask on, you, you know, where about – I'm <laughs> uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, said, I guess it just depends on where you sit. Yeah. Um, in yeah. terms of uh, the, the, you know, the, the computers are, are, are definitely the algorithm yeah. to micro-target to such an extent – that they really draw these districts in a very fine way um, to maximally exploit partisan advantage. Yep.
Um, all right. So first, first, I'm going to ask you what can we try to do about all this and, and, and what proposals you have. And then I'm going to ask you a question we may actually disagree about because that's more fun than always agreeing. So um, uh-huh. what, 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 what should we do? What, what, what is, is there, an, is there, are there solutions to all this? Well, I mean, I, I think part of what's going on right now is, is the solution in that, you know, mobilization, engagement, um, and voting are at, at bottom the most important things that anybody can do right now. Um, but once, you know, for, so not, <laughs> I am trying not to be too hopeful because. No, no, I, no, you know, no, that's not the point of this. But let's, but, let's just assume things go in such a way that reform is possible. Yeah. If reform is possible, we have to move fast and do things that are actually going to lock in democratic practices. And that means using every congressional tool and state house tool to ensure that districts are fairly drawn. Um, you know, Congress needs to pass. I mean, HR one is actually a really good bill. It includes a lot of provisions um, dealing with um, with voting rights, with gerrymandering, with money in politics to the extent that we can um, uh, deal with that um, uh, w- without undoing Citizens United and Buckley. Um, and so all that is incredibly vital. Looking at DC votes, Puerto Rico, um, those things should have to be done right away. Um, no dithering, no two years, no trying to negotiate with Republicans like Obama did on the Affordable Care Act. It's just there's no time. They're not going to be there. Let's just be honest. Let's go for it. Um, so that's sort of number one. Um, number two is we cannot ever, ever again forget about the courts and be passive there. Um, uh, we need to ha- we need to have good judges who actually believe that the Constitution is not um, a, a uh, some kind of uh, doesn't lock us into a 1789 point of view, um, which for many of us isn't such a great place to be. <laughs> um, but actually, you know, looks at the Constitution as what it is, which is an aspirational, um, broad textured um, uh, document that was meant to uh, to to live beyond its time frame um, and be expansive. Um, uh, and we need to, so we need judges who are going to understand that when Congress passes a law under the 14th and 15th Amendment. Um, that says that Congress has the ability to fulfill these terms, that that's what it means, and you understand it, and then voting rights and other types of protections need to be um, to be um, deferred to when Congress does that. And then, you know, a, a First Amendment interpretation that recognizes that um, it's not a free-for-all for, for plutocrats to buy our, um, uh, to buy elections, that, you know, everybody has freedom of speech, not just Based on on uh, your zip code, if you live in Greenwich or uh, or some other wealthy enclave, um, but everybody should have an equivalent ability to 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 speak their mind, and that includes voting and having yeah. their vote mean the same. So, so I hope we I hope and you hope we both hope that we have the occasion to discuss what the Democrats should do if they win the presidency and the Senate. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. My fear is that Biden's going to win the popular vote by 7 to 10 million votes. And somehow Trump gets through the Electoral College, and then we have riots in the streets, which I think will happen if mm-hmm. that happens. Um, so I'm hoping that does, I'm hoping, but let's assume Democrats win the House, I mean, win the Senate, win, win the presidency. So w- what I've been saying for a long time, um, and no liberals ever agreed with me except for two, Mark Tushnet and Larry Kramer, and Jeremy Waldron, three, excuse me. Oh, I agreed with them. They came before me. I agreed with them. Uh, we don't need to strengthen the courts. We don't need to pack the courts. We need to decimate the courts in this, in this mm-hmm. sense. Get out of the way it, for both sides. Un- unless something is clearly unconstitutional, Brown is correctly decided, Obergefell is correctly decided, just read the Equal Protection Clause. That, you get that. Mm-hmm. Um, VMI is correctly decided. You know, women uh-huh. should have equal rights. Um, you can't get to any of those cases through originalism. They're all, they're all you know, you right. just can't. They've tried, but they failed. Horrible. Yeah. Um, but my view on the court is different than the traditional liberals, which is I am not a fan of the Warren court. I think the Warren court gave us Trump. I just, I really do. Without Roe, there's no Trump. I really believe that. Um, so my view is the Democrats need to weaken the courts, not because Republicans control the courts now, but for all time. Which yeah. maybe Republicans would buy into, maybe, if we control everything. Um, where are you on weakening the courts versus packing the courts? Well, you know, I, I'm going to disappoint you, Eric, yeah. because okay. I'm actually going to agree with you. Really? Um, okay. I, I agree very much with this idea that, I, well, here, here's the thing. So our, the courts are so powerful. It's like we have this 
this little um, uh, uh, council of ayatollahs sitting up there who, you know, they have such an ability to affect all of our lives. They are not elected. They serve under, you know, somebody would say for life, but, you know, for good behavior. Um, uh, and um, uh, so can be there for extended, extended periods of time, even though what the decisions they're issuing are completely out of step with how most Americans understand the Constitution or see our politics or understand how con how statutes should be interpreted or what kind of deference should be given to the um, to the elected branches. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually very much with you. Um, uh, I, you know, I think but I, maybe I, I would say let's not get out of the we can't get out of the way until we get a handle on the court. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to get out of the way when it's a six three. Um, well, I agree. Far right dominance. Right. Um, I think we first have to do things like um, uh, uh, adding a few judges. We have to think about the 18 year terms, changing the jurisdiction, which I think is actually yep. a very um, interesting area. I think there are a lot of reforms that, I, you know, I think it's crazy that ju justices don't have to recuse themselves when they have financial or personal interests at stake in a case in front of the court. Yep. There are lots of reforms for the Supreme Court, but right now they're the most powerful people in America. And that for me is an absolute affront to dem democracy. So um, you and I did not have any conversations in 2016 about this, um, but I said all of that in 2016 and I said it before Trump won and I be begged l prominent liberals and progressives and good friends of mine to jump on a proposal to keep the court at 4-4 Republicans, Democrats for the rest of time. Um, the president can nominate anybody he wants, but the Senate doesn't have to confirm. We know this now. The Senate doesn't have to confirm anybody. And if a Republican dies or retires, a Republican comes in. And if there's a really strong independent, I had a fix for that, too. Um, mm -hmm. In 2016, conservatives were very interested in that proposal. And my liberal friends thought I was, well, you know, you all were saying yeah. you ACS was saying we need nine. I was saying eight yeah. is great. Um, uh. I, 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 what, what, I, what I'm afraid of and what I think liberals and Democrats, and, and this is my last question to you, have to be really careful about, is proposals to make the courts more liberal other than at an equipoise won't, won't be – the American people won't go for that and there will be a backlash. But proposals that come with weakening the court forever for both sides, I think the American people could get behind. So whether it's an yeah. even number of justices or, so, or, or today in the New York Times, Kent Greenfield, our friend Kent, has a great op-ed about having an intermediate court of appeals. Chris mm -hmm. Brigman has an article coming out in NYU about jurisdiction stripping. Whatever it is, it has to be the same for both sides once we even it out. Do you, do you, right. agree, do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with that. I think, I think we need to have – do need an equilibrium here. I think yeah. – I, I, I find it really distasteful to be fighting over the courts, honestly. Yeah. You know, I, I think they should be a completely independent and neutral body. Um, and let's have our fights over policy when yeah. we elect members of Congress and the president and the state house and whatever and our mayors. Um, so, you know, I, it's distasteful and it's wrong. Right. But until we get to a point where we can counter what the right has done – um, we would we would put what the vast majority of Americans believe in and expect from our government um, at a huge disadvantage. So um, I agree. so yes, I think that's where we should and have to go. It's like we need a we need a, a grand um, negotiating session or something, a disarmament session yes. um, with the with the right and say you know. If we were in a Rawlsian world, you know, what would be the system we would pick? It wouldn't. That be was my argument, and, and people yeah. like Ed Whalen agreed when he thought that Trump, you know, that Hillary was going to win. I mean, Ed's a joke, but I mean, you know, the, but others on the. I mean, there, there's a, there's a law professor at um, Pepperdine who's conservative who wrote a piece in the Times, totally agreeing with everything about you know, we need mm -hmm. to find those people and and get them yeah. in a room with Democrats and you know. Totally with you. Yeah. You um, know. You know, I, I've done about eight radio shows in the last four days and a bunch of podcasts. And I keep saying, and I think you're going to agree with this, like actually what you and I should be talking about now are legislative measures that we think are good for America to deal with climate change, racial injustice. Um, oh, COVID? You know, COVID, of course. Um, and conservatives should be having the same conversations about their yeah. views on those things. What yeah, we shouldn't totally. be talking about is a damn court. I mean, that's... Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally there. I mean, it, right. it's 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 we've gotten so 
uh, this is so imbalanced and the court the courts well the court is affecting all of those things right the yep. rulings on yep. on on elections and pandemic responses and yep. climate change etc are you know going to determine everything that we care about in those areas okay well you know normally i don't end these on somber notes but <laughs> it is a somber time maybe next week will be a less somber time if we're lucky yeah um Thank you so much for doing that. I love talking to you. We could talk for hours. Yeah, it was great right. to talk to you, Eric. Thanks Thank so much for inviting me on. And, no. Um, uh, here's Pleasure is all mine. Me. And I hope we get to work together on the future, in the future, not on the court, but on legislative type things that the court won't interfere with. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. Really appreciate that. it. All right. Okay.